about soft matter, certain ideas around soft matter. And I'll give you dates and a sort of history because it's supposed to be a history of ideas. But the lack of a clear chronology actually reflects the fact that this is, has been a messy area, sometimes contested, as well as it's very interdisciplinary. So people working in one area have been completely unaware sometimes of related work in another area that contribute to our overall understanding of, these, of this field currently. In fact, some major advances were only understood to be such much, much later. But you should think of this as a feature and not as a bug. Gautam, you're muted. Yeah. Hello, Gautam, you got muted. Yeah, are we back? Yeah, yes, yes. So when we think about materials, this is the diversity that we see around us. We can see tree trunks, stained glass, the, 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 the silicon chip that you can see on the top, marble that you can see below. And the questions that we might ask about materials are all very generic questions. What are the atoms that constitute them and how are these atoms arranged? Because the larger question is, as a scientist, how can I measure, understand, and compute the properties of matter, whatever matter, all of the examples that I showed you on the earlier page. But more for this particular talk, one can broaden this question and say, what new concepts must I require in order to understand the structure of different types of matter and materials? So behind everything that I will talk about is the idea of a deformation, a change of shape. And we can draw a very clear contrast between materials that resist being deformed if you apply a certain force to them versus materials that are easy to deform. And really this depends upon the scale of forces. If you have a Hulk-like scale of forces, it's much easier to deform materials. But if you're like me or like you, it's much harder to exert, we will only exert maybe a thousandth to the force that someone like the Incredible Hulk might be able to exert. So materials that resist being deformed are the sort of examples that I gave you about. And here, when one talks about the physics of these things, we talk about crystals, we talk about amorphous materials, composites, metals, insulators, and properties of materials like brittleness. Is it easy to break them? Ductile. Can you draw them into long wires? The conductivity, the purity, the band structure, magnetic properties, etc. So all of this is a language that we're accustomed to using for materials that resist being deformed. But if you look at materials like this, so here are three examples. That's ice cream, that's soft serve ice cream, that's tomato ketchup, and there's toothpaste here. It isn't clear that the same set of ideas might work. Here's an example of another object that is really takes very, very little forces to deform. It flows into whatever shape it wants due to the shape of the container that you actually put it. And that is a fluid. Here's a somewhat more complicated system. This is a fluid with things in it. This is a Himalayan stream. And that's suspensions because the stream carries down organic matter, little pieces of stone, et cetera, et cetera, pieces of sand across. So this is to be thought of as a suspension of materials, a suspension within a flow. If you look at the materials as the examples that I told you earlier, both the example of the ice cream as well as the toothpaste, you'll understand that these are man-made materials. And therefore you can hope to engineer their properties in order to do something specific that you might want to do with them. And we'll come back to both these, in these examples right at the end. We'll talk about ice cream, we'll talk about toothpaste, it's generic examples of how it is, of what goes into thinking about them, what goes into the materials that constitute them, into the mix of these, and how exactly the properties are engineered using ideas behind soft matter physics. One thing about these materials, the two examples that I showed you, as well as the examples earlier, the examples of the suspension, the examples of the fluid, is that these materials are thought of as being soft and squishy. We can ask what makes them soft and squishy as opposed to hard and undeformable with any reasonable amount of force. What gives them these special properties? And what are the concepts, of course, as I said, which emerge when you think about them? Are there new concepts? Are there new ways of thinking about materials of this type that we have to think about? So the first question is, what are the spatial scales of soft matter systems? And over here, it's very, very broad. You can go that it, it makes sense to talk of numbers like 10 to the power minus 10 meters, which is the angstrom scale. We won't go, nothing in soft matter really requires an understanding of anything smaller than that. So the 10 to the power minus 10 meters, which is the size of an atom, is typically the smallest that you might ever want to get. And on the other hand, you go all the way to 10 to the five meters. This is the scale of mountains, this is the scale of earth, et cetera, because you can see that these are objects that are flow. You need a larger scale of forces to make them flow, but nevertheless, they flow. But much of the interest in these materials come from a fairly short range 
around about 10 to the power minus six meters, which is one micrometer. And this scale is called the Brownian scale. And the properties of motion at room temperatures in this scale is called Brownian motion. It's also interestingly the scale of a cell, whether the larger, more complicated cells that make up your body or the smaller bacterial cells that give us potentially infections, bacterial infections. So Brownian motion was named after the botanist Robert Brown, who used a microscope in 1827 to look at pollen grains in water, and he could not explain what he was seeing. So what is it that Mr. Brown was seeing? He made an account of his observations over here. The paper is titled on the particles contained in the pollen of plants and on the general existence of active molecules in organic and inorganic bodies. So he died, he lived between 1773 and 1858. Among the inorganic bodies that he looked at under his microscope were little pieces of the Sphinx. The idea being that this is something that had stayed in, in, in the middle of the desert under the scorching sun for millennia. And therefore this was least likely to contain any trace of organic material. Therefore you could make the distinction between whether what he was seeing was due to something that was organic in character, something that was living either before or after, or something that was inorganic, definitively dead. So this is a description of what Brown actually saw. So he said each microscopic particle placed in water or in fact in any other liquid, instead of falling in a regular manner, as we are accustomed to, if you take a large ball, put it in water, it will fall down. But provided they're sufficiently small, instead of falling in a regular manner, they exhibit a continuous and perfectly irregular agitation. It goes to and fro while turning about, it rises, falls, rises again, without tending in any way towards repose and maintaining indefinitely the same mean state of agitation. So here's the trajectory. This is from a lecture by Perrin, Nobel lecture in 1926, that says, here's the trajectory of the pollen grain or the piece of sphinx as it goes forward. And you can see there is no regularity. There's no, there's no sort of identifiable structure to this. In fact, if you started off with another particle coming to the same starting point, it might take completely different trajectory. As I said, continuous and perfectly irregular agitation goes to and fro, etc. It was Einstein who pointed out, this is probably in his, his important paper of 1905, that the reason for this provides a proof for the existence of atoms, a proof that had been absent until that point, because you can only, you cannot see an atom directly and certainly with the technology that you could use then. But on the other hand, you could infer the presence of atoms by looking at Brownian motion. And the little gif that you see to the right represents the larger particle, which you can see under the microscope, in the sea of smaller particles that keep constantly hitting against it. And it's this imbalance in forces, a purely instantaneous imbalance of forces that leads to this complex trajectory of these particles. Incidentally, Einstein's papers on Brownian motion have been cited many more times than his papers on special relativity or the photoelectric effect, mainly because the ideas behind Brownian motion really intersect many, many areas, including, for example, economics or uh, ecology and so on. This, the, the phenomenon of Brownian motion also underlies diffusion. For example, if you take a little piece, a little drop of, of, of a dye molecule and put it in the fluid and watch it spread out, that really happens because the molecules of the dye are themselves undergoing Brownian motion. And they, as, they, as they move along, they occupy larger and larger regions of space. And finally, your whole, the, the whole of, of, that, of that container is filled up with the same uniform color because the molecules have moved to fill up the entire space. One term that we're going to use is a term called the colloidal regime. And the colloidal regime is applied to anything that's about one micron in size or 10 to the, 10 to the minus six meters in size. Colloids, the word colloid comes the word from the word glue-like, representing an aggregate that contains many atoms. So this again reflects, as I said, the uncertainties behind what these objects were that people began to measure, began to try and understand and the confusions around what they were at a more molecular level, at a more microscopic level. So one example, milk is a colloid. Milk contains globules of fat that can be fairly large, suspended in, 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 in really in water, along with a bunch of other proteins together with them. The interesting thing about colloids is because they're large enough, they're a micron in size, if you form a lattice out of it, if you form a regular crystal out of it, the spacing of that crystal, of the atoms in that crystal is enough to diffract light. So just as we study in physics in, 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 our, in, in, in a bachelor's degree in physics, the Bragg's law for scattering, which requires that the spacing between planes be comparable to the wavelength of whatever it is that you're pushing. And therefore you can only look at crystals, at regular crystals using X-rays. You can look at colloidal crystals using ordinary light. 
And you can see that, the, that depending upon the spacing at which you probe these things, you can look at the different colors that you see on the right hand side, the green, the red, the blue. This is called structural color. It comes because of the structure of the material and the way it's put together. And the colloidal crystal lattice, as I said, has, has planes which are spaced at distances of order of the wavelength of light. And that's what makes them special. You can see this lovely color in these colors, the spectrum of colors, in, even in a small test tube that you hold that contains the colloidal crystal. The colloids also show what's called the Tyndall effect. You shine a laser beam through it. If you pass it to pure water, you cannot see the trace of that beam. But in a colloidal suspension, you can see that because the colloidal particles are large enough to actually scatter the light that is emitted from the laser. The time scales of soft matter, we'll spend sort of brief, brief time on this, is somewhere between the micros microsecond to the second, although it again technically spans all the way from nanosecond, which is the time it takes for a small molecule maybe to, to flip over and rearrange, and goes all the way to years. For example, the motion of a glacier is also to be understood through ideas of rheology of soft matter, et cetera. And that can be taken, you can see noticeable motion of some glaciers a few centimeters per year, but over to see larger scale changes, it might take several years. So that's a range of time scales that we might be interested in. So here's an example of how slow things can get. This is an example where pitch, an experiment of, 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 a, of an object called pitch was set up. And the appearance and the dropping of individual uh, drops from that pitch has been monitored now for 84 years. And now I think they're probably on the, on the eighth drop or the ninth drop at the moment by this time. Pitch is a very, very slow, extremely viscous uh, liquid. And therefore the formation of the drops that emerge from that under gravity takes a long, long, long time. So that's the longest time scales that we might be able to think about in an experiment on soft matter. I want to talk about these 10 points. I won't take much time over each of them. I'll finish, I, I hope, well in time. I want to talk about motivating ideas, where they came from, what their context is, and finally think about a few examples that represent these. The first is the ubiquity of thermal fluctuations, and that we already saw in a sense when we discussed Brownian motion. All of that comes because small molecules in the liquid that surrounds the bigger molecule, the bigger particle that you can see, the pollen grain, are constantly moving. They're moving because they, they undergo thermal fluctuations. And that's what we will deal with. I'll talk about molecular shape and complexity and what that means. I'll talk about effective interactions and broken symmetry. So here is really the core of what makes soft matter physics interesting and the core of what is important about it. Because these are ideas that don't emerge in any quantum mechanical or any other sort of more formal ways of thinking about these systems. They're very peculiar to thinking about the importance of statistical physics, the importance of entropy in these systems. I'll talk about broken symmetries and what they mean. I will talk about the computer simulations and the information that you get from them. I'll talk about flows and why they're important. I'll deal with defects. And then I will describe some scaling ideas for complex systems. I'll tell you what the glassy state is. And finally, wind up with what is the current frontier of thinking about soft condensed matter physics. This may look like a lot of points, but there really aren't that many of them. And we'll, they will deal with them fairly fast. So the example behind the ubiquity of thermal fluctuations, as I said, goes back to Brown. This gives you an idea of what the basic energy scales are of something that is sitting inside a fluid. This accounts the fact that soft matter systems really can change their structure just purely through thermal forces suggests why they might be considered to be soft world deformation. In fact, that's the definition, the classic definition of a soft matter system, that it can, its, its structure can change in significant ways just purely through thermal fluctuations. The energy from thermal fluctuations is estimated, and most of you know how to do this. You multiply the Boltzmann constant by the temperature that gives you an energy. This is an energy that is about 0 0.025 electron volts at 300 Kelvin. That's a sort of elemental, the, the unit almost of energy at that scale that is able to propel the particle that you can see in that jet forward on this completely random trajectory. Molecular shape and complexity. So here I want to give you a specific example. This is an example of something called a surfactant molecule, I first developed by chemists in 1929. And this molecule has two parts. One part is a part that loves water. It's called hydrophilic. So it has a hedge part that you can see, the circular part that is hydrophilic. And it has two hydrocarbon chains below that two, one, two, three, maybe more. These are called hydrophobic. So these, that is a hydrophilic part, a head part, and a hydrophobic tail part. There shouldn't be a head, that should be written as a tail, as you can see in that picture above there. What happens is that these are now molecules that like to sit at the interfaces. So this is an interface between water and air. And because the heads like the water, the heads will go and sit at the, at the interface of the air and the water. But the tails don't like water, so they will stick out on the air side. So this is a molecule that likes surfaces 
It's called a surfactant system or surface active system. And that's another word for it. This is why these are called surfactant molecules or equivalently amphiphilic molecules. This is what you can get purely by the chemistry of changing the shape of the molecule. If, you, if the tail is such that it sort of looks as though it can be confined in a cone, you get things, objects, we put many of them together naturally, purely in equilibrium. You will generate what are called spherical micelles, spherical little structures there, where all the tails are formed towards the inside and, and the heads towards the outside. If the shape is even slightly changed to form a truncated cone, you still form the same structures, but now you have a narrow cylinder that passes through them. A truncated cone of a somewhat different shape will give you a vesicle, a bilayer of vesicle with one layer on the top, one layer below, intercalated like this, but then bent, bending over like that. And for something that is cylindrical in its tail, that gives you basically a bilayer that is flat. And this flat bilayer is really what goes into covering all of the cells in your body. We're all covered with a layer called the plasma membrane. That is exactly this. It's a bilayer of surfactant molecules with heads pointing towards the outside. The idea of taking basic units and making much longer structures out of this, going from a monomer to a polymer, is also very crucial. And this is, again, a sort of chemistry breakthrough from the 1830s. And you can see, look at polyethylene over there, where you take a monomer, a simple ethylene monomer, use a catalyst, and then build up these huge structures, huge linear structures of these, which can be more than 75,000 units of the, of the original basic monomeric unit. The fact that you can make very long structures out of this means that those structures will have very different physical properties. For example, they can find knots, you can have topological constraints that prevent how they flow. And all of this is important if you look at the varieties of the types of structures that you can form. The polymers can be linear, they can be branched, they can be cross-linked in various ways, they can form complicated network structures. And all of this complexity goes up one whole notch. If you allow yourself to add different types of units with two components, for example, you can see that in the picture below and to the right, where you have a red component and a black component. And you, here you can put them in at random. You can put black, red, black, red, alternating. You can put them in blocks, a block of red, a block of black, a block of red, et cetera. Or you can graph them. You can have red tails coming out of a body which is black tails coming out of the body, which is red. And all of these are really the miracles of chemistry that enable you to create complicated structures that you can now customize to the sort of applications that you want to think about. Let's now talk about effective interactions. And this is the very classic picture of how two inert gas molecules come to bring them together might interact. There are two paths to this. One is a path that is attractive, that comes down, and then there's a deep well of direct of, of height epsilon, and there's a hard core. So you cannot overlap things. Think of these as two balls which tend to attract each other. So they'd like to come closer and closer to each other, but at some point they hit each other and then they cannot interpenetrate. So that's a hard core that you can see towards the left. And this is a very generic way of thinking about how. You know, how, how more or less spherical atoms might, might interact with each other. One goes usually uses this as a reference for most of those ideas. But life, of course, is much more complicated. There are charges that are there on these molecules. There are charges that are released into the surrounding solution whenever I put certain molecules into water. These interactions are mediated via whatever ions. I may add salt, which then dissociates within the solution, giving ions. And these ions can screen the charges that exist already. The finite size of the particle, we described that earlier, although that's not quite where it enters, but you can explicitly put in the fact that this has a hard core and any coating that the particle might have will further complicate the nature of the interaction that this particle has with other particles. So it turns out that the actual, if you put in electrostatics, if you add the Van der Waals interaction, you add all of the physics of this complexity with which you can make and, and make, the, make these materials in real life, you get to something called the DLVO potential or the Dariagoin, Landau, Verbe, and Overby, developed over a bunch of years between 1923 and 1948. This is very interesting. If you look at it, it has art that's attractive at long distances. So provided you keep your two objects that are interacting with this potential far away, they'll want to come together. But then there is a repulsive part and that comes from the, so you have to overcome that repulsive part in some way in order to get even closer to that. And if you get really close at really short distances, there is a further attraction that comes in. So materials that interact with this, their minimum energy is really obtained when they all come very close together, when they flocculate technically with each other. So this is one idea that has to do with physics of that sort. It's an idea developed by Asakura and Osawa called the depletion interaction. And that tells you what the complexities that happen if you just have two components inside. 
So here is two larger particles. You can think of them as your pollen grains or something. And then the little black circles are the smaller particles. And they're all moving around together. The only condition is that they cannot overlap each other. These are called hardcore particles. Now note the following, and that's what these gentlemen noted, these two Japanese physicists noticed about 60, 70 years ago, that there is an effective attraction between the bigger particles that's mediated by a very simple factor. Once I bring them closer together, I have now pushed out the small particles from the space in between. There is no space for them. But now all the particles that can come and push them on the outside will tend to maintain the forces that, kept, that keep them plastered up against each other, even though there is no real attraction. This is an indirect attraction. It's called the depletion attraction because I have managed to deplete the little particles from the space in between. And another example of where the DLVO potential comes in is an old, old example. So this is millennia old with the first dates to the first use of ink using typically some carbon black particles in some, in some fluid. The problem is that this ink deteriorates with time. If you just take carbon black and put it in a fluid, it works the first time around. You keep it in your cupboard for about, for about a week or so, you will see that those carbon particles have begun to aggregate and your ink is then useless from then on. What's happened, so that aggregation is a consequence of that attraction at very small distances, which wants to flocculate the particles together. So in order to prevent that, what you do is to coat the particles with a polymer. And in practice, that's done by using a polymer called Arabic gum. And all this has been known to, for, to in since antiquity that this is the way to stabilize an ink. And effectively what that does is to expand the size of the particle with these polymers and prevent that, that from actually accessing that little attractive part because they will never come close enough to sample that part of the potential. Let's talk about exotic broken symmetry. And here is an example of a somewhat unusually shaped molecule. And this is an example of, of a molecule that is kind of cylindrical or ellipsoidal in character. And an isotropic phase of these molecules is a phase in which they're pointing in any whichever direction. There is no noticeable order. It basically looks like a liquid or funny, funnily shaped molecule. This is called an isotropic liquid. When there are many subtle ways of breaking the symmetry, the isotropic symmetry that exists here. And one way is just to line them up more or less in the same direction. And this is described as a pneumatic phase. Over here, there is some sense of orientational order. Unlike the previous picture, where they were all positioned at random, pointing in random direction, you now have a, a sense of more or less pointing in the same direction. So the orientation is roughly common to all of these molecules. And you can have a large number of them. But there is no sense in which they're placed anywhere regularly in space with respect to each other. So you have broken, you have gained one type of order, you have broken one type of symmetry, you have gained orientational order, but you have sacrificed translational order, you don't have translational order anymore. And this, in 1888 by Reinitzer, is a discovery of liquid crystals for the first time. The fact that you could have something that was intermediate, a new state of matter that could not be thought of as solid, liquid, gas, or plasma. This is none of that. It's a strange liquid with a certain type of order, but not the sort of order that you might expect of a solid. And finally, the crystal is the most ordered structure of all. It has both orientational order, all of the point in the same direction, as well as translational order. There's a fixed distance, a fixed separation between these. They form a perfectly regular crystal. So that's even more complicated technically because I can go from the crystal to the liquid crystal to the liquid, the pneumatic that I considered by heating and cooling or changing the density. The pneumatic is just one of a large number of what are called liquid crystalline phases. You can have funny phases that kind of look like pneumatics but are layered and this is called a smectic phase. With a different shape of molecule, you can form long columns, which are not precisely spaced with respect to each other, but they could be ordered in this particular direction. So there is a huge zoo of such phases, of liquid crystalline phases, probably more than 40 by now. By now. They have exquisitely designed symmetries, breaking of, of symmetries, strange chemistry, as well as a bunch of applications. But most of these applications really, I mean, the, the real reason to study this is because they're fascinating from a theoretical point of view in terms of the diversity of structures and order that you might gain in systems like this. The fifth point that I wanted to discuss was the intuition that we have gained from computer simulations. And this, again, we jump many years. This is 1957. And this is a system of hard objects, a hard sphere. A hard sphere, think of this as just a system of, of, um, of billiard balls. So think of these balls as moving around in a room, just at random, et cetera. You can throw more in, remove some, so you can change the density of these. There, is no, there seems to be no way. Remember that the moment you separate them out, they don't see each other, they don't interact anymore. So you might imagine intuitively, the only thing for them to do is just to keep randomly moving, that at any density that you might think, you just have them moving altogether. It was the first shown in computer simulations of hard spheres. 
that you could have a crystal that formed from purely hard objects that only saw each other upon contact and could not penetrate each other, but did not see each other the moment you separated them out. So you can have a liquid, you can have a crystal, and if you manage to circumvent the crystal, you can even wind up with a glassy state in which you have essentially solid-like behavior, but without the long range order that accompanies the crystal. This is an astonishing result. And in fact, it's very hard to think about this in any intuitive term. If you think about it intuitively, there is, if, you can, if you're not seeing another particle at all, the moment you're away from it, there's nothing to suggest that you should be sensitive to where it's located in a crystal. That even if I put them here, 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 separated from, they're not touching each other. Even if I put them separated from each other at, these, at, the, at the sort of densities and volume fractions that I'm considering, the fact that it forms a crystal is of extremely unusual and very non-intuitive, which nevertheless, now we now understand this. It really comes from considerations of entropy. The sixth point that I had was the impact of flow behavior. And it's impossible to talk about soft matter physics without talking about flows. And here's where you combine ideas from fluid dynamics, continuous media, et cetera, that engineers and, and know very well, physicists know a little, little less. And here there's a whole range of names associated with this. Newton, Bernoulli, Euler, Helmholtz, Prantl, Navier, Stokes, Taylor, pretty much every famous name from about 1600 onwards in, 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 in the science of, in, in, in science as a whole has been involved in trying to understand the nature of fluids. The thing about fluids is they're happy to adapt to any shape you impose upon them. So deforming them is completely fine. What fluids don't like is reforming them deforming them faster as opposed to slower. So how fast you impose that change of shape actually matters to the fluid. The faster you do it, the more the resistance to that change. And that's really what, what, um, what, what Newton pointed out. In, in, in his first approach to understanding the nature of molecular viscosity. And all changes of shape involve some molecules moving relative to other molecules. Different parts of the liquid, the reason for the viscosity, the fact that liquids don't like to flow, is that parts of the liquid don't like to move at different speeds. And the idea of a viscosity is a quantification of this very specific point. Water and honey, which you both know of as liquids, are liquids of very different viscosity. Take water in a glass, pour it out. Take honey in a glass, pour it out. The rate at which that shape changes as the, as, as the stream of honey and water come out is very, very different. That's because the honey resists a relative change, a relative velocity between different parts of the fluid much more than the water does. So here's the standard undergraduate example where you take a ball and you drop it through fluids of different viscosity. And the, the larger the viscosity, the slower the fluid drops. That's because the fluid has to, the, the ball has to push out layers of fluid from beside it. That is restrained. The fluid prevents that. It doesn't like that because it doesn't like a differential between the rates at which the velocity, diff, different parts of it don't like to move at different, different velocity. And therefore the ball proceeds at a much slower pace on the right-hand side for a high viscosity liquid and for the left-hand side. But there's more stuff that's interesting. Some materials can behave either like liquids or like solids, depending upon how fast you make them change their shape and by how much you make them shape. Shapes change, as I said, because atoms and molecules must move out to their earlier positions in order to take new ones. If you change too fast, atoms and molecules can't keep up. They resist the change. That's a property really of a solid, the inability or the, 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 the lack of wanting to move out of a preferred position. But if you do it slowly enough, then they can flow smoothly if they're liquids. But how molecules are connected to each other, how you change those connections also matter to flow properties. Quick example, this is a skydiver falling down with hopefully with a parachute attached to his back. You can ask the question, without a parachute to slow you down, what would the experience of jumping into the ocean from an airplane actually be like? And that's the question to ask from, from a picture like that. And the answer is that if you try to change the shapes of fluid very fast, for example, you hit the water, the water now has to flow around you. The water must flow around your body as it hits it with high velocity. It resists that. It behaves much more solid-like. So its answer is it's not good. This, this belongs, this idea belongs to an, a family of ideas called viscoelasticity, again associated with Maxwell, Boltzmann, Kelvin, all very famous names. So essentially, falling from an airplane and hitting the water in an ocean is kind of like, and it's not, not exactly the same like, but it's sort of like falling onto a concrete from a height. There's not really not that much of a difference. Let's look at my favorite food example. This is, this is tomato ketchup. This is uh, kisan, no onion, no garlic tomato sauce. Look at the cartoon here. So that you see this person walking through the desert, finding a bottle of ketchup, deciding completely, you know, he's, he's, he's very thirsty, picks a bottle up, shakes it, puts it into mouth, and the, nothing comes out of the bottle. Does it again, does it again, finally you know, dies out of hunger and exhaustion. You can see the skeleton there. And that's the point at which the little drop fall, the little drop of ketchup falls out of the bottle. 
again, universal problem. We've now kind of solved it by very, very careful design of ketchup bottles. So people who are a little older than, than 10 or 20 years will remember the older ketchup bottle where you had to pretty much bang at it from the top in order to get the ketchup to flow. The reason for this is that there is the, the sauce behaves it, it's held together by a bunch of cross-linkers. It doesn't move. It really moves like a solid. It's a gel-like object. It's only when you shake that you can disrupt the connection between these molecules, and then they behave in a more fluid-like manner. So the fact that you have to apply a certain critical amount of force in order to get it to move is the idea called a yield stress. And that's an idea that turns up in a bunch of other places. We'll talk about it maybe a little bit later. But that's the yield stress in another term called thixotropy is what determines why it is that ketchup bottles have, you know, take so long to emit their ketchup. And you really have to shake it or disturb it in some way for that to happen. Let me get to my seventh point, which is about defects and ordering. And here is where we get into overlaps between very modern types of physics, as well as really old ideas that come from soft matter physics. In fact, essentially devised by thinking about pneumatic liquid crystals that you learned about a little bit earlier. Imagine a set of arrows that are all perfectly ordered. So the top picture that you can see there is arrows which point all in the same direction. So they're orientationally ordered, but they're also at very specific lattice points. So they're also crystalline ordered if you actually want to. Now imagine that you can now change the orientation of these arrows and look at the picture. Which the Hello? Can, we, uh, can we have the sound off? So look at the two pictures below. And the picture on the left is a different arrangement of the arrows, which seems sort of stream out of a common center. And the picture to the right is again something where at the center, the position that the arrow should point in is not precisely prescribed, but as you move further and further away, arrows kind of all look as though they're pointing in the same direction. These are called topological defects. And the answer is the idea is that you cannot change the picture like the two pictures that you see below into the picture that you see above in any smooth or continuous way. Once you freeze this, you will invariably wind up, if, even if you try to move it a little bit at a time, you will wind up with situations where you have something that is perpendicular to something else, which costs a lot of energy if you associate an energy with some small deviation from that perfect arrangement that you see on the top. So the ideas behind topological defects are, are also very old. They're also very modern. There was, a, there was a, 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 a Nobel Prize for the discovery of the mathematics behind these topological defects a few years ago for Thaulus and Koskelet. You can also see it on your finger. And these are sort of pictures of defects that you can see in the alignments of the walls on your fingers. You can see a defect called a plus one defect, a minus one half defect. And these correspond to the picture that you can see before it. The classification of defects that is based on topology that we won't get into. It's just, just to emphasize the point that these structures are also there as part of our lives. We, we, we do see the nature of unusual types of order and topology in stuff that we do on a regular basis in our real life. You don't have to go to complicated quantum mechanical systems in order to try and understand that. Very briefly, scaling ideas for complex systems is something that has motivated a lot of these fields. And this starts with the work of the chemist Flore, the physicist Dijen, over a long period. And the simplest example of this is to understand the shape of a coil of a long polymer inside a fluid. And here, the idea, the fundamental idea is that the polymer behaves essentially like a random walk or the same sort of diffusive motion that we saw in the earlier picture, just sort of randomly going back and forth. And therefore, there is a relationship between roughly the space that it occupies, the rough radius of a ball that I might draw to enclose it completely, and the number of units that it consists of. So R proportional to n to the power one half is a fundamental result that comes from diffusion, comes from the theory of random walks. So the way to show it is that you plot the log of r versus the log of n, and you get a straight line with a slope of one half. The twist to this, if you're thinking about real physical molecules, is that real physical molecules cannot cross each other, whereas a particle that is doing Brownian motion can come back to its earlier point. So once I account for the fact that it cannot cross each other, this tends to swell up the polymer a little bit. And the relationship between the space that is required to enclose it and the number of units it has changes very subtly. It changes to n to the three, three by five or 0.6 compared to the n to the power one half. Now I can ask what happens if I take this, this chain, this one chain and put it in a mesh of other chains, in a melt of other chains. What is the precise relationship between the two endpoints, the R required to do to the endpoint? Very surprisingly, it turns out that it's exactly the same as the case for the Brownian, for the motion for the random walk. Again, the relationship between R and N is simply R proportional to n to the power one half. Very profound and important result from Duchenne. And scaling argument, this is hardly a scaling argument. It's, it's, it's probably the most baby version of these. But it's these relationships where you don't, where you ask about how does this behave as I increment another quantity? How do, what is the relationship between R and N at large length scales? 
that goes into motivating many subtle ideas behind how we understand soft matter today. My ninth point was the problem of the glassy state. And this is the problem that goes back to antiquity. I mean, you can see there are examples of glass that are formed when meteors have hit the earth, God knows when. And the glass is to be understood as something that is completely out of equilibrium. It's not a crystal. So just think of the regular glass that you can see in your window. But this glass appears to be solid on a short time scale, but actually it, at the microscopic level, it is slowly, slowly, slowly changing. It's only changing very, very slowly. It seems as though it would like to be a liquid. It's continuously relaxing towards some form of the liquid state, but it's doing so very, very slowly. Here's a picture of what, uh, what might happen. You start off with a liquid in thermal equilibrium, a well-behaved liquid like water. And at some point, if it's a decent liquid, we expect it to suddenly form a crystal in what's called a first order transition, where it jumps, its density jumps from a, a sort of a low value to a high value, because typically crystals tend to be more dense than the liquid. But what would happen if you could supercool that liquid, if you, if you carried on past the point where it would normally become a crystal? So you usually have to do this very slowly. And at some point, it becomes what is called a glassy material where all motion, detectable motion between the supercooled molecules in the supercooled liquid and another amorphous state that really resembles a solid in terms of its hardness, that is a glassy state. So what is a glassy state? Why is it different from the crystal? Why do materials tend to form glasses and what do they actually do? And about this particular point, let me just stress that, the, that Anderson, Nobel laureate, said in 1995, that the deepest and most interesting unsolved problem in solid state theory is probably the theory of the nature of the glass and the glass transition. So that's why, again, this is very canonically part of thinking about soft matter. And it's part of soft matter because of the way the viscosity changes as you go closer and closer to the glass transition. We can start off with the liquid that has a low viscosity. Take a water, for example, or take honey. This is something that flows relatively easily. But as you go closer and closer to the glass transition, the viscosity increases. And it's not just increases by a factor of two or three, it's increasing by orders of magnitude because it's a log scale that you can see on the y-axis. So between this point where it starts off as a liquid at high temperature to the point where it becomes a glass, which is conventionally defined as some 12, on 12 10 to the power 12 pascal second on, a, on, on this scale here, you can see that that's essentially 14 orders of magnitude between regular liquid and a highly, highly, highly liquid, viscous liquid that, is, that really is our definition of the glass. This is a mechanical definition. It's just done by convention. But you can see how strangely and strongly these, these uh, properties change as you change the temperature as you approach the glass transition. The last point that I wanted to make in this particular section was to talk about active matter living systems. And here's an example of something that is manifestly soft. This is a white blood cell chasing a little bacterium, going after it, nosing around. But you can see that its shape is changing, it's moving. So now the question is, this seems to be soft matter of a very different type. It doesn't look like an ice cream. It doesn't look like a, the sort of example that I showed you earlier. It's something that seems to have intent. It seems to be moving in a particular direction. It seems to be driven in some way. What is the nature of the physics language that we must use to describe living systems? And this is an, these are ideas that developed really from the 1990s. There's an Indian name, Sri Ram Ramaswamy, associated really with the beginning of these ideas, including many scientists from all over the world, Jacques Pro, Jean-François Joanny, et cetera. And their idea is that we should think about these as systems with a very, very specific ability to take, to take in energy at the microscopic scale and break it down and convert that into work. So these are systems that have to be out of equilibrium. They're not like the simple example. This is not Brownian motion anymore, where you think of a temperature. These systems cannot be thought of in terms of a, of a temperature at all. But then one needs a new physics, one needs a new theory in order to be able to describe them. And that's what these people actually developed. I want to finish up with two examples, which I think are interesting examples. So let me start with, I said I have two favorite examples. One is toothpaste. So let me remind you about toothpaste. Toothpaste behaves like a solid at rest when it's inside a tube. And toothpaste will not flow out when you remove the cap, but it will flow out when you squeeze the tube. Once you squeeze the tube, it acts like a thick liquid and flows out from the tube onto your toothbrush. And once it's on the toothbrush, even gravity is not enough to make it flow downwards. You don't have to worry about it flowing off the brush. So it behaves like a solid at rest some of the time, it behaves like a fluid when you apply a force to compress the, the toothpaste tube. So that's the example of a yield point, a minimum force that must be applied to the toothpaste tube before it starts to flow. And below the yield point, toothpaste doesn't flow out of its tube if no force is applied, so it behaves like a solid, kind of like the same example that we used for the ketchup. 
what goes into, into toothpaste? Well, bacterial biofilms, otherwise called plaque, build up on teeth every 12 to 24 hours. It's toothpaste that makes your brushing more, more effective because it contains abrasive. And these abrasives can remove the bacteria, can remove the stains that they might cause without damaging the teeth because they're really very small. Toothpaste foams because it contains, contains a detergent, a surfactant as we learned earlier, which is another type of cleaning agent. This loosens down, it attaches to the interface between oil and water. It breaks down substances on your teeth that would otherwise not be dissolved because oil and water don't like to mix. And you can then rinse them away with water once they have emerged into the solution. Here's a not so pleasant example, which I can see in Delhi. This is the Yamuna, and this is the sort of toxic uh, froth of the Yamuna, really comes from surfactants, surfactant molecules that have been released. Why it, exactly it happens in this particular season, of course, the value has never been very clear, but abnormally high levels of surfactants is what gives rise to behavior like this. There are other ingredients that maintain the integrity of the toothpaste, retain moisture, etc. These are called binding agents. If toothpaste didn't have these components, it would dry out immediately or require some sort of stirring. There's flavoring because we appreciate, we can tell the difference between Colgate and neem and so on. So the flavoring is also an important component of the ingredients that go into a toothpaste. Let's now switch to ice cream, my final example. And ice cream contains water, sweeteners, flavorings, emulsifiers, stabilizers, milk fat, and milk solids. So this complex mixture of different types of chemicals, some of which are familiar to you and some of which are not. The idea behind ice cream is that it combines liquids that don't mix under normal circumstances, which is fats. That it is liquid particles of fat that are spread through a mixture of water, sugar, and ice together with air bubbles. So all of these are all very important. Fats don't mix well. So fat would normally have a tendency to separate out. It doesn't like to contact the water. So in order to compact that, you have to add various materials to this mix. You have to add a surfactant material to give you an emulsifier to prevent, to sit at the interface between the fat and the water and make it stable. And this acts like a sponge absorbing and locking in space and it behaves like a liquid. Stabilizers keep the material uniform, make, give you a tasty, uh, creamy texture and prevent importantly large crystals from forming. With stabilizers, ice cream contains small ice crystals that melt more slowly and um, it's important when you make an ice cream to prevent ice, from free, ice cream from freezing because that alters the quality of ice cream. Soft serve ice cream that, you're the, the, that you can have, it needs crystals to be very small. So you need to freeze it quickly so that it doesn't form a larger crystal. It's still about 60% water. When you serve it at the usual temperatures, not all of it is frozen. And that's what makes it easily scoopable in soft serve ice cream. And the, yeah. I want to sort of wind up with this point that soft matter science, we talked about little pieces of the history, the little pieces of ideas that sort of come into to, to, to thinking about soft matter. And I wanted to point out that it was very different from the way the, all of the language and ideas that we used to think about hard materials, materials that it is hard to perform. So soft matter science really sits at the intersection of basic science, applied science and technologies. Very importantly, it's physics at a human scale. This is physics of toothpaste and ice creams and food. And, and you know, it, it's stuff that you can see. It, it's physics of sweat, it's physics of oil. All of this is accessible to anybody who's just looking out to their window to see what's happening. And, what, and it's physics that you can actually test out yourself because as I said, these are deformable systems. You don't have to, and, and that really is a consequence of the fact that of a molecular complexity inside them. This, the foundations of this field come from statistical physics, classical mechanics, fluid mechanics, complexity in general, and not from the quantum mechanical principles that govern them. Finally, nature is quantum mechanical, but that quantum mechanics really applies at the level of the individual atoms that go up into making these materials. Once I form large molecules out of these more complex structures, then the behavior for the sorts of questions that I want to ask, provided they're not questions about atoms, are really governed by a different sort of physics altogether. And that physics has to do with temperature, deformability, statistics, fluids, et cetera, et cetera. Many ideas for how to think about complexity came from soft matter and statistical physics. For example, Parisi's Nobel Prize, the most recent Nobel Prize this year, is for work on a model developed by Edwards and Anderson, where Sam Edwards was thinking about rubbers and how to think of the properties of rubbers using tools of statistical mechanics. So he developed something called the replica trick. The replica trick was then used by Parisi and converted into a mathematical methodology to understand complex systems. And of course, Dijen is another French physicist whose influence pervades all this and who worked on issues of soft matter, statistical physics and complexity, tying all of these different things together. So that's my last slide. I would repeat everything that I said. I, these are, I think, the 10 major points for me 
that really govern the importance of thinking about statistical physics, the history of ideas behind statistical physics. As I said, it's a complex history because many people did many things differently at different times. It was chemical engineers, people who worked in aeronautics, people who worked in fluids, people who worked in polymers, experimentalists who worked in liquid crystals, just out of the sheer interest in synthesizing new types of molecules. But what we understand from this is there is a certain remarkable variety in the nature of complexity that you can generate from this. And what's very special about it is this direct connection between applied and pure physics and physics as a whole, along with, with technology, as you can see from all of the examples that I gave you. And right now, the frontier of this field is trying to understand living systems from a perspective that combines soft matter science with the statistical physics of non-equilibrium. And that, I think, will be the important area in the next several years to go. But certainly, everything that I've told you about really is a topic of intense and current research. And it's among the most in, in interesting and exciting things to be thinking about at this point of time. So thank you very much for your patience. I think I've stopped in, in good time. Let me stop sharing and Professor Puri and I will be happy to take questions. Great. So thanks a lot, Professor Puri and Professor Menon for these two remarkable lectures. Uh, so we'll, this is a time for asking questions to the speaker, our questions or comments. It is welcome for your comment. You can directly ask, you don't have to write, just directly ask. So maybe I can start the first question. And my first question is to Professor Puri. So Professor Puri, I mean, uh, you have, this is something I always wondered as a student and while teaching quantum mechanics also, there's uh, Schrodinger particularly. I mean, Schrodinger's immense contribution to wave mechanics. And then later in his life, uh, his uh, kind of antithesis to quantum mechanics. I mean, this is very strange that uh, the person who invented wave mechanics later has become so much uh, opposed to the idea of quantum mechanics itself. Mm -hmm. So can you comment on this? I mean, it is, is it same as because of Einstein kind of things as Einstein believed or is it something else? I really can't comment on this. Uh, I, I really do not know. For example, uh, as uh, I gave uh, uh, the example of conversation uh, of Einstein with others, you see, he did something when, uh, uh, say, earlier that he always said that uh, <clears throat> the uh, the physics uh, theory should be based on observable things. And then he changes his stand later on. No, I do not know why he does that. So similar thing with Schrodinger, for example. I do not know. I have no idea. Okay. So any other question, please? Uh, hello? Yeah, Prasanna. Uh, am I audible? Hi. Uh, yes. No, I am Samu here. Hi, sir. Please, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, my question is to Professor Puri. Uh, actually, for the and when will I, uh, I mean this uh, uh, nice talk, Professor. Uh, I my question is from a different context. And uh, when uh, Ullenberg and Goudsmith, uh, I uh, I mean get the idea of spin. But before that, Pauli had discovered that I mean, the, Pauli had the spin matrices and all. So how did he got to that point? Get to the point that, that there must be some matrices of spin, or that there must be some description of spin? Because previously, uh, uh, it was just a speculation uh, for uh, uh, Compton effect from, from Compton, but he never did anything brief. Uh, can you? Hmm. You say the idea of uh, spin emerges uh, from <clears throat> symmetry considerations. So if you do symmetry transformation, rotation in space, and then the uh, you will find that this is uh, rotation is uh, generated. I mean, when you uh, rotation in space, now you look at the corresponding uh, uh, unitary transformation on, on, on the state vector. And you see that it is generated by uh, certain operators. And when you look at the commutation relation of those operators, they are same as angular momentum commutation relations. But, but based on those commutation relations, if you find out the, uh, you know, the uh, possible values of uh, total angular momentum, so to say, you also get uh, you know, uh, angular momentum uh, in the units of half. So, uh, so, uh, so that, uh, that is how you see the idea of spin emerges uh, 
from basic, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the from, from symmetric considerations. But, well, that is the idea coming out of theory. But then uh, you have to, you know, establish it uh, experimentally. That is different. And as far as polyspin uh, matrices are concerned, they are not only for spin. They are for any two-level, uh, 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 you know, for a two-dimensional Hilbert space. So that two-dimensional Hilbert space can be anything, not necessarily spin. So, in fact, you see the uh, uh, Ullenbach and uh, that you mentioned about the discovery of uh, uh, for, for the concept of spin. Really speaking, before that, uh, if you look at this uh, experiment of uh, uh, what is that? Uh, uh, Sternberg experiment. No, no, that is the uh, Sternberg experiment. So really speaking, uh, you see, in Stern Gerlach experiment, uh, in the spin was in it. It was uh, you see the, the what they discovered, what they saw was due to spin. It was never uh, uh, you know it 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 came known. It came to be known much much later. You see, uh, in their experiment, they were uh, looking for uh, what they call space quantization of angular momentum, and they uh, and they got you know. Uh, this impression of uh, you know two uh, 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 two uh, the, uh, like it is you know so uh, the uh, uh, beam splitting up in uh, two, but then it was pointed out much much later that uh, what they were uh, you see the uh, what was it was it silver atoms so whatever was the ground state of what their atom I don't remember now that was L, uh, uh, that uh, you see that was L equal to zeros. Thing. So it could never have been due to angular momentum. So really speaking, what they saw was uh, the effect of the spin half of electron and not angular momentum. In fact, if you if you look at uh, there is very interesting article in uh, Physics Today many years ago that uh, this discovery was you see attributed to the cigar that those people smoke. You see, they conducted their experiments several times, but they could never see the impressions on their photographic plate they were looking for. They gave up, got together after a couple of years. And when one was, uh, both of them, you know, they, they smoke cigar. One of them was looking at the photographic plate, other standing behind was smoking. And then the, you know, this impression of two, uh, you know, uh, the blocks appears uh, on their uh, on their plate. So this uh, is something which is historically noted that the you see. So so you see. Uh, uh, so uh, I mean, uh, it is uh, you can have theoretical predictions, but uh, then experimental observation is a different thing. Even in this case of you know Ullenbach's this thing. So before that, Pauli's uh, student some name is given, I don't remember. He had the same ideas, but they say that uh, Polly was uh, not very kind to their students. So he told his student half, don't talk nonsense, uh, student off. He said, don't talk nonsense. But later on, <laughs> Olin back and this, that came up. Anyway, I don't know if I answered your question or not. Yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah, Prasanna. So, uh, I have a, a couple of questions, one for Gautam and then for Professor Puri. So, uh, hi, Gautam, great talk. So, uh, I think this is a, I mean, it's probably an unfair question, but let me still ask it. So, uh, you had one slide on glass. So, would it be possible to, uh, for, for sort of people uh, still looking at this kind of stuff from a research point of view, like sort of what are the at the current state of the art, what is the big outstanding question, for example, let's say in theory in terms of glass transition and let's say in experiments where we have, I, I suppose that we sort of frequently hit a block or something like this in sort of difficult questions, but where are we right now? That's the question for Gautam. And then the question for Professor Puri is, uh, this is something that is also, uh, I've heard in talks on histories of quantum mechanics, the point of uh, when did sort of complex numbers enter quantum mechanics like uh, could we have formulated quantum mechanics without complex numbers so maybe uh, you guys can decide which order to answer yeah thanks great talk well, gotham can answer first yeah. i'll go first um there are certain very 
precise question that are posed by the experimental data. One is called the vogel fulcher tamman law for how viscosities, for example, behave with temperature. The other is a form of what is called stretched exponential relaxation for, for quantities that is also measured in experiments. So these, the exponent in the stretched exponential relaxation, the derivation of the vogel fulcher law, all of these are things that a theory has to be able to do. And the current theory, the current sort of uh, promising theory, is something called the random first order transition, RFOT approach to this. And that seems to be able to derive some of these things correctly. I mean, it's not without controversies. But I think the this, this sort of questions are non-mean field theory versus mean field theory. Many of these approaches are intrinsically what are called mean field theory approaches. But this is a system in finite three dimensions. Does it, is it right to apply mean field theories to that system? What is the sort of, you know, there's a lot of technical jugglery and very clever, uh, you know, very, very complicated mathematics that goes into it. But finally, to what extent does that relate to real physical systems is still, is still somewhat unclear. I think there are many frontiers in this, in the simulation area. There's much to be done there. The whole variety of different types of glasses, different types of glass formers, the complexities in those. Many of these things we still have to understand. And now there's a very important interface with, uh, with technology as well. To make good metallic glasses is technologically important. So there's another reason to try and understand it at a fundamental level. Thanks. Professor Puri, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, Prasanna, I mean, uh, uh, the, as far as this uh, 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 appearance of uh, complex numbers in quantum mechanics is concerned, you see that uh, there were developments uh, uh, in, uh, in dispersion uh, uh, theory, uh, starting from, uh, say, uh, maybe uh, maybe early 1900 uh, onwards. Of course, it definitely came in Heisenberg's uh, formalism. Complex numbers, they definitely came there, as you can see. But uh, in between, when did they enter? It's very difficult for me to say. But I don't think, I mean, as the, the papers I remember, you know, the dispersion theory papers, so they, in fact, even the Kramer's, uh, you know, dispersion uh, relation, if I remember correctly, there the transition probabilities were used, not transition amplitudes, as far as I remember. So uh, it's very difficult for me to say on the way from 1900 to 1925. 25, definitely. Mm -hmm. But before that, I don't know. I see. I see. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mandos. Yeah, so there is a question in the uh, from somebody Manu Upadhyay. He asked to Professor Puri uh, whether it's if Dirac, while formulating the matrix differentiation, what he discussed the Q derivative, mm -hmm. gave any proof of the thing. Sorry. So whether Dirac has gave any proof of some kind of it? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. It's not that he see. Uh, he uh, he starts with the uh, base, the assumption that uh, quantum derivative should have these properties, and from there he, and then the subsequent relation. I think uh, what he is referring to is that uh, uh, matri all matrices D A by D C equal to commutator of uh, some K with A. I think he is referring to this. He gives a proof. Yeah, he does. Uh, there is also a question for uh, Gautam saying that how are these ideas in soft matter physics affecting the development of material science? So they're very important. You can see the example that I gave you, the toothpaste, the, the, the toothpaste example, the ice cream example. Uh, cosmetics, the cosmetic industry is founded on, on, on ideas behind soft matter. Petroleum extraction, fracking, etc. founded on these ideas. So they're very, very much a part of of modern technology. We tend to think of silicon chips, et cetera, as being sort of you know, where stuff is really going. But if you look at the range of food science, it's a huge area. So these are things that we, as physicists, we don't normally think of physics and don't automatically intersect as we think about the more sexy applications of physics. But they're actually fundamental. And they're all over the place. So any other question? Rupto, may I? Yeah, please, Rupak. Yeah. Hi, Gautam, Rupak here. So both of you, wonderful uh, talk. So for Gautam, the question is, uh, the community is often divided uh, on this definition of self-organization versus self-assembly. Because you covered both 
talking about surfactants, amphiphilic materials, as well as active material towards the fag end of your talk. How would you, to a layman, given your background in stat make and soft matter, give the main definition, main, main difference between these two terms? So I'm not sure I have a very good answer for that. I think everyone you might ask will have, I don't think there's a strict technical definition. Self-assembly, I think of as being what you would get under normal thermodynamic molecule that you put into water, but then miraculously they form these sheets or these form these closed topics. That's just equilibrium self-assembly because that happens to be the state that minimizes the free energy. Self-organization is more complex. Self-organization requires self-assembly, but it can also require complex hierarchies and structures. The cell is extremely self-organized. It has a lot of complexity hidden inside this bag. So there's something, to, the contents inside are different from the contents outside. They're structured in complex ways. So self-organization requires a few orders of magnitude more, I think, work to try and understand. It seems to be impossible to understand true self-organization without in, involving non-equilibrium physics, which is physics that we know much less about. Equilibrium physics, we really know a lot about. But non-equilibrium is really a frontier in terms of how, especially how do living things function? How do they organize? How do they transfer information? These are all sort of, you know, frontier areas. Great question. Yeah, thanks. So, so basically what you're saying is that as long as, so this is non-equilibrium, self-organization is essentially non-equilibrium condition. And would you also go ahead to say that uh, mostly active material, something which is interacting with the system by changing its state or position, can be termed to be more like self-organized rather than self-assembly, which is more like only the interactions between the solvents and the materials themselves? I would say that, but that's, as I said, my, that's my terminology. I mean, some people, I've heard people talk about non-equilibrium self-assembly, sort of suggesting that you make something under a shear or you, you have different ways of putting energy into it. When, we, when I talk about active system, which is my context typically for thinking about self-organization in a non-equilibrium context, the energy supply is very local to different points inside. It's not sort of globally supplied. For example, if I just drop a ball, I'm supplying energy via the Earth's gravitational field to the whole object as it goes. That's one way of driving it. So there, there are these subtle distinctions. I don't think there's a universal definition. I think of self-organization as being essentially non-equilibrium very hierarchical, much more structured, and requiring self-assembly at some level. I think of self-assembly as being the poor cousin, the sort of the basic guy who gets the work done as part of that. But this, as I said, this is my definition. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Any other comment or uh, question? OK, so there is another question, which is for Professor Menon, uh, would self-organizing system far from equilibrium rather than non-equilibrium requiring energy to maintain? I think of these as the same. I mean, you, whether it's close to equilibrium or far from equilibrium, you have to have some way of keeping it out of equilibrium. And in these, you have to be able to supply energy from outside. So whether, and you, you it's, a, it's mo the better way of thinking about it is that it's a steady state of some kind. And you maintain that steady state out of thermal equilibrium. But whether far or close to doesn't really make a difference. There, it, I mean, it may make a difference in terms of the types of structure. They're they not too different from each other. OK, so any more questions or comments? If it is not, so let me thank Professor Puri and uh, Professor Gautam Menon for their wonderful lectures. And we are very grateful for from IIT Gandhinagar Physics Discipline for this lectures. We hope that we will continue to arrange more such lectures as a continuation of the next edition of the same program. And till then, bye. And uh, let's hope we'll have not online, rather offline version of these lectures. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.